Well, if you're just joining with us this Sunday, we are at the very end of our sermon series through the Lord's Prayer. There are 57 words in the original Greek of Matthew's Gospel, and we have said that these 57 words are words that change the world. Uh, they really do. And um, we said previously that the only thing the first disciples of Jesus were ever uh, recorded to have asked him was, Lord, teach us to pray. There's no record of anyone asking Jesus to teach them leadership or counseling or healing or preaching. I mean, most likely they asked Jesus to show them, show them those things, but there's no record of them doing so. Presumably because they saw that prayer was you know, the source of all of his ministry. I mean, where did he get his power to do all these things, exorcisms and teachings and so forth? It was out of this vitalized relationship that he had with his heavenly father. Uh, so Lord, teach us how to pray. And then he gives us these 57 words, and this is his answer. Let's read them one last time. From Matthew 6, verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, you probably noticed that the, the traditional ending of the Lord's Prayer that we normally say when we pray it, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, is missing in this translation of the Bible. And the reason being, it's missing in all of the early manuscripts. So the, to, the, to the best of our you know, un understanding, um, it probably wasn't original. Um, even if what expre it expresses is unmistakably true, it was probably not original, and, um, and that's why I'm not going to preach on it this morning. But that thir the verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Greek will allow a, a, a different rendering of that last word. It can also refer to deliver us from the evil one which is you know, close, closely related, but uh, not identical. Back in May, uh, this sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer received a great deal of attention. Uh, I don't know if you were reading about it, but it made national and even international headlines as the Pope, uh, the Bishop of Rome, decided officially to change the rendering of the sixth petition. And they, he replaced the words, lead us not into temptation, with the words, do not allow us to fall into temptation, or do not let us to fall into temptation. According to the Vatican News Service, the change followed 16 years of research done by experts who found a, a mistake in the current translation, quote, from a mistake from a theological, pastoral, and stylistic viewpoint. Notice they didn't say grammatical from a theological, pastoral, and stylistic viewpoint. So yeah, it was all over the news. The Italian media in, ended up interviewing the Pope and asking him, why the change? I mean, Christians have been praying the Lord's Prayer for two millennia the same way. What is your rationale? And he said the rationale that he gave to the Italian news services was that the traditional translation portrays God, portrays God in a false light. Quote, I am the one who falls. It is not God pushing me into temptation to then see how I have fallen. Um, a father doesn't do that. A father helps you to get up immediately. It's Satan who leads us into temptation. That is his department. Well, what are we to say to this? With, with all due respect to the Vatican, um, I think there is a problem with the Pope's rationale. For it seems as though the, the, the Pope is saying, uh, let's look and, s and see how human fathers behave. And we know that a human father doesn't allow their son or daughter, doesn't lead their son or daughter into an X-rated movie theater. A, a human father wouldn't do that. And therefore, our Heavenly Father, he must do the same. Um, only Satan leads us into temptation. A human father doesn't lead us into temptation. Good and earthly fathers would never do that. 
And therefore, we, we need to you know, mis- retranslate the Lord's Prayer. I suggest to you that that approach has it all backwards. The starting point for all theological enterprise, it can't be with us. It can't be with, with man. It has to be with God. We start with God, how God reveals himself to us in the scriptures, in the text, and it's really incumbent upon God to tell us Here is what I am like. Uh, The text tells us what he's like and how he operates. And as far as the text of verse 13 is concerned, so the Greek word, I'll I'll just mention two uh, additional Greek words here. The Greek word for temptation, there's a little fudge factor with that word. Uh, That word throughout the Bible is variously translated as either temptation, testings, or trials. I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, and it, it's regularly rendered that way. But the Greek word for lead us, it's, there isn't the fudge factor. I mean, according to the verb tense, it means just that, to bring us or lead us into, into temptation. And uh, as one Greek scholar said in reply to the Pope, he said, we cannot go from an active verb, subjunctive mood, aorist tense, second person singular, with a clear direct object, Two, a wholly different verb completed by an infinitive, the infinitive here being to fall, that is nowhere found in the text. You can't do that without shifting from translation to theological exegesis, or in just very simple words, in, in, in English words, the reason you translated it, retranslated that way is because you didn't like the theology it espoused. It's not because that's the most natural or, uh, it's not because it's, that's the most natural reading of the Greek. I'm really surprised, though, that they would break with tradition. And we're talking about 2,000 years, yes, of tradition on a theological point that is so well substantiated in the Bible. And it's this, God really does bring people into times of trials and testings and into temptations. Now, you may not like that portrait of God in the Bible, but that is unmistakably the portrait of God that is given to us in his word. Okay, a good example of this, a big example, is Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. The passage where Abraham uh, is tested by God in order to offer up his son Isaac as a sacrifice. The uh, Genesis 22.1, the very same word that is used here for temptation in the Greek, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, 22.1, is, is simply the word testing. It says, and God tested Abraham, the very same word. Um, and Abraham, by God's grace, passed the test, and, and he trusted in, in God, and God provided the sacrifice, which is a ma- magnificent picture of what God the Father would do with Christ. Another example of God leading someone into temptation is the example of Job. I mean, what happened in the story of Job? God allows Satan access to Job to test and try him through a series of calamities. God unmistakably led Job into that. Job's faith almost breaks, but it doesn't. And in the end, Job's faith is stronger, having been... um, well, we sing about it in the second hymn. Uh, you know, my dross, our, our dross to consume and our gold to refine. If you need yet another example of it, and this is the best one, I mean, the, the classic case of God leading someone into temptation in the Bible is none other than Jesus himself. Matthew 4, 1, we read, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness in order to be tempted by the devil. And right there you have it. That, it's case closed. God led him into the wilderness, into the place of trial and testings. And yet you notice a very important distinction. We are not saying that God tempts anyone. James, in his letter, says God tempts no one. The Pope is right in that Satan is the one who does the tempting. But what we cannot say is that God won't lead you into a place where that will happen. Sometimes he does. He takes you to places where your faith is tested and tried. 
And we know that he has one reason for that. The devil has a different reason. Uh, God uses our testings to purify our faith, to teach us to trust in him more, to rely upon him more. The evil one uses our testings and trials to cause us to sin, to tempt us to sin, and to make us doubt the goodness of God. So there's a very good precedent in the Bible for thinking that God might bring you into a time of trial. And that is why it's, we should pray, do not lead us into, um, into, into testings, trials, and temptations. <clears throat> there's one other thing that I want to say about this from uh, the first century context that was probably in view when, the, when Jesus originally taught them. What is the great, Jesus regularly would talk about a great trial, a huge trial that was going to come upon the early Christians in the first century. What was that great trial? It was none other than the, the besiege of the Roman Empire and the Roman centurions upon the city of Jerusalem in AD 70, and eventually the conquering of the city and the great slaughter of the city's inhabitants. That was the great trial that in Jesus' later sermons, his discourses, we call it the Olivet Discourse, where he says, pray that, that this doesn't happen at certain times of the year, or pray that this doesn't happen while you're pregnant, because it is going to be a time of, of indescribable suffering, and you are to pray, Lord, spare us from that testing. So certainly that was, that was likely in view. I really appreciate the way that the Heidelberg Catechism, which we utilized already in our service, the way the Heidelberg Catechism treats this sixth petition. And, and uh, I'll, I'll return to it in a second. Let me describe it to you first through a psychology experiment. It seems like I'm always doing <laughs> psychology experiments that um, I find interesting, but... Here's one. So a few years back, they took several former cigarette smokers as test subjects. Group A, they called the lions, and group B, they called the kittens. <laughs> and as their names would suggest, the lions were those people who were self-described, very confident and assured in their ability to just say no. Uh, they were, you know, I, I'm not going to take another puff. Um, and the kittens are what you'd expect. They were very dubious about the power of their self-will to hold out. Well, what they did is they showed them a video, a movie uh, of some sort, that uh, made smoking a cigarette just the allure of smoking a cigarette nearly irresistible. <laughs> and then they said, we're going to step out of the room for a few minutes here slide this pack of cigarettes into the middle of the table and you do what you will. They come back in, you know, 15 or 20 minutes later and what do you guess happened? Who was more susceptible to take a smoke? And they, I don't know what the exact percentages were, but as you would guess, the lions, those who were very self-assured in their strength and their willpower, they were far more likely to give in to the cravings than were the kittens. And isn't that what the Heidelberg Catechism is saying right here? It says, what we mean by the sixth petition is, Lord, we are so weak. We are so weak in ourselves. We are so weak that we cannot even stand for a moment. Lord, I am weak. The sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer is a humble admission that, God, I am weak, and I don't feel like I'm ready I don't feel like I'm ready for a time of testing and trial. And so we're saying, Lord, because I am weak, please don't lead me there. You know, I'm not ready for this. I'm a kitten, not a lion. I am a, I'm a disabled kitten, <laughs> a deaf, dumb, and blind kitten, or at least that's how I feel. So please, Lord, don't give me more than my faith can handle. And right now, I feel like my faith can't handle very much. So that's what he's saying. Don't lead me there, Lord. But then notice how the second line of this expedition modifies the first. I'm not ready. Do not lead me into temptation. But if you choose in, in, your, will, in your wise providence and will to do so, then if you choose to lead me in a time of testing and trial, then please deliver me from the evil one. Please deliver me from evil and from the temptations 
that would come from him. So do you see how, I, I think most of us, when we've prayed this prayer so many times, and we really missed the significance of saying, I am so weak, don't lead me there, because I'm not ready to be tested and tried. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, whenever we talk about the matter of temptation in the Christian life, I mean, that, is, that should be our go-to verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul writes, No temptation has overtaken you, except that which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. And the encouragement there that Paul gives us is twofold. Number one is the commonality of all human temptation. And number two is the promise of a way out. Number one, Paul assures us that no matter how dark, how twisted, how foolish, how terrible are the things that come into my mind when I'm being tempted, or the things that are surrounding me, there is nothing that I'm experiencing that you haven't also. That is the commonality of all of our temptations. Like I am, in this moment, I am not a special case scenario. I'm going through something that brothers and sisters in the faith have been dealing with for, for thousands and thousands of years. And so the commonality of temptation, I think it helps us, it just helps us to realize that, that this is something that other brothers and sisters have conquered. Um, and it's also something where we can turn to other brothers and sisters to help us uh, go through. And then number two, he assures us that there is a way out. That although sin is very, 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 very enticing, escape is always, 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 always possible. Which is something that... I mean, let's be honest. Most of us, we just don't believe. We, we really don't believe that escape is always, always possible. Uh, we go through the Christian life. We, we're defeated so many times with re the same recurrent sins. We develop a great deal of cynicism, spiritual cynicism. And we're like, yeah, okay, by possible, if you mean like one half of 1%, possible, then sure, I believe that. But, but we don't believe it's possible the way that Paul talks about its possibility uh, of, like, you're, you're now filled with the Spirit. You're no, you're no longer subject to your old master. You have a new spirit, the very spirit of resurrection, the very spirit that rose Jesus out of the grave on the third day. That is a spirit that lives in you. You're not subject to that old master. I mean, Paul's he is, he's pretty bold when he says that escape is possible. Um, and we're pretty cynical. <laughs> and so, yes, God will always provide a way out. When temptation comes, you are to look for the God-given escape hatch because he always provides a way out. And I've got to think. So, uh, um, one of the important first century documents that was written by the early Christians that didn't make it into the Bible, but is very instructive for us on how the early Christians were living out their faith. It's called, I've referenced it many times before, the Didache. The Didache was an instruction manual for Jewish converts to Christianity. It was written, it might have been written as early as 70 AD. Certainly it was written by 90 AD. And when you, there's a section in the Didache about the Lord's Prayer. And at the very end of the section, there's, it's almost like a throwaway, throwaway line. But it says, oh, and by the way, you should pray this prayer three times a day. Pray it morning, noon, and night is the suggestion. You're to pray the Lord's Prayer three, th three times a day. And in doing that, they were drawing upon a custom very familiar to, to Jewish people and it, very familiar to the Old Testament of observing fixed regular hours of prayer. I'm going to do this. I'm going to pray morning. I'm going to pray noon. I'm going to pray night. The early church ended up deciding to expand it, I think, to four fixed regular times of prayer, 6 a.m., 9 a.m., noon, and then three in the afternoon. And, it, and you may be aware that that practice is still followed in monasteries, particularly Eastern monasteries, Eastern Orthodox monasteries today. C 
Could it be that that is part of the God-designed escape hatch? Regularly pray. I mean, prayer, it, does a ha- it has a way of it, shaking the cobwebs out of our minds and, and making us alert when you really pray and go into the presence of God. It has a way of, oh. um, And I wonder, yeah, I wonder if that isn't part of his appointed escape hatch. Lord, don't lead me into a time of, of testing, but I'm in one right now, and I am weak, and I am not ready, and therefore deliver me. David French is a columnist for the National Review of very a sharp mind that you may, maybe you've heard of David French before. He wrote a week or so ago a, an article on, where he was reflecting on a, a very sad topic, it, the apostasy of Joshua Harris. Apostasy is one of those big words that means you know, turning away from Christ, turning away from the faith. Joshua Harris was a, a, a megachurch pastor, kind of a celebrity pastor. He uh, wrote a book which was entitled, Why I Kissed Dating Goodbye. Ever heard of that one before? It was kind of his take on Christians, teenage Christians shouldn't do dating. They, they need to follow the courtship model. And Harris pastored a very large church in Maryland, a Reformed Baptist church. But then he came out, oh, about two weeks ago on Instagram with a picture of him you know, sitting in front of, um, I don't know, it looks like a high mountain lake. And he says, I'm not a Christian anymore. And I disavow everything I wrote in my book. And I am like 100% LGP, LGBT Q plus whatever other needs to be added to that acronym. I'm 100% there. That's where I'm, where I'm at today. And so French is writing this article reflecting on his apostasy and, and the apostasy of several other pretty high-profile Christians recently. And here's what he says. I think it's, it's important to just hear this again. As our, quote, as our culture changes and secularizes, and grows less tolerant of Christian orthodoxy, I'm noticing a pattern in many of the people who fall away. They're retreating from the faith, not because they're ignorant of the key tenets of Christianity, and not because they lack the necessary intellectual and theological depth to process the key tenets of of, uh, orthodox Christianity, but rather because the adversity, the, the headwind they face holding to counter, counter-cultural Christian doctrine, the headwind grows too strong for them. The adversity grows too strong for them. Or to put it another way, he says the failure of the church is not a failure of catechesis. That is, a, of teaching our children the faith. The failure of the church is a failure of fortification, of building, this is the key line, of building the moral courage and resolve to live your faith in the face of immense cultural headwinds. Uh, Kind of a cool side note on this. David French's daughter is um, part of Reformed University Fellowship at the University of Tennessee. And she was part of the group of students from Boise State and Tennessee, and I can't remember the other university. What was it? in Texas, who ended up going with Shelton to Oxford this past summer, and he got to meet his, uh, the daughter, and had, I think, some great conversations with her um, about the faith. David French is a very smart man. David French knows that knowledge of the Bible is at an all-time low among American Christians. David French knows that a lot of churches have failed in the matter of catechesis, catechizing our children. And yet he says, I think that the the bigger issue that we'll face going forward is have we prepared our kids for the profound social consequences that are going to come upon them in the near future as our culture shifts? And so when we pray, deliver us from the evil one, we're praying us, it's for us, for us, for the church, and for the church's children, 
God, like help us instill upon them the moral courage and fortitude that is going to be necessary. And it's going to be necessary. I mean, it's already necessary in different parts of America today. I mean, imagine how hard it is to be a Christian, a faithful Orthodox Christian up in New England today, up in Boston. It's so hard. Uh, we are going to be facing, we're going to be facing, even in Idaho, uh, very stiff challenges, I think, in, in the not-so-distant future. And we're going to have to make hard choices. And that choice may be to, to be faithful to Orthodox Christianity and lose a friend. Be faithful to Orthodox Christianity and lose your reputation uh, or, or lose your job. And the great challenge will be for us when that time of testing and trial comes, what are we going to do about it? And what are our kids going to do about it? I mean, I think especially about our kids because that's, that's who it's going to hit the most. There's one additional aspect of deliver us from the evil one I like to focus on. And this one is my, is my favorite. <laughs> this, is, I, this is really cool. I'll just say it. Yeah, it's the coolest part of the sermon, right? <laughs> I want you to take a moment to consider how the Lord of the Rings story ends on the slopes of Mount Doom. Now, there are a myriad of different ways that God can deliver us from the evil one. And I've already touched on some of those. He can provide a escape hatch. He can provide a Christian friend. He can uh, fortify you and make you strong. But there's another way that Tolkien talks about, and I never realized it until this week. The, what he really exemplifies at the end of The Lord of the Rings. So the story is Frodo has carried the ring of power across Middle Earth through the borders and into the very heart of Mordor. And Sam has been his constant companion, sacrificing his strength to carry Frodo when Frodo could no longer do it on his own power. Picture the scene at the end. The, the two heroes have made it all the way to the ledge there on Mount Doom. And all Frodo has to do is toss the ring into the lava and what, uh, what I think Tolkien wants us to remember is this exact same scenario happened just a few millennia before. The king of Gondor, Isildur, he was standing in that exact same spot. He had, he had severed the, uh, uh, the, the uh, finger off of Sauron and with it the ring, and he was holding onto the ring. And all he had to do, just like Frodo, was throw the ring into the lava but he failed to do so because the ring was too powerful and it corrupted him and, and he as a man was weak. Well, there's an obvious parallel being drawn here by having Frodo stand in that same place. And if you think about the way that authors would normally write the story, I would guess 99.999% of authors who have written this great epic would at the end of the epic, when you have the two heroes there, the, the heroes would triumph right? They would overcome the temptation and toss the ring into the lava. In the face of terribly difficult, insurmountable odds, the hero, you know, finds the strength inside of him uh, to throw it into the lava. That's the way the story would be written today, but it's not. Frodo fails. He succumbs to the same fate that fell upon Isildur. Um, and hobbits, who have throughout the whole series been shown to be remarkably strong creatures, surprisingly strong creatures, they fail the same way that men do. In other words, hobbits are weak too. Yet the story does not end with Frodo's failure. At that very moment, the very moment that Frodo gives in to evil and puts the ring on his finger in order to vanish and take it away for himself to become another dark lord, Gollum pounces upon him, and in a throwback to what happened to Isildur, Gollum severs the, the finger off of Frodo's hand, and uh, as the two combatants struggle for control of the ring, uh, they both desire, Gollum falls into the lava, and the ring is destroyed, and thus evil is conquered because evil destroys itself. Now, the reason I think that's important, 
When we look out at the church, capital C, today, in the Western world, the church is a pathetically, we are a pathetically weak institution. I mean, it's de- in the Western world, we are nearing a low point of all low points for the church. We are so weak, we might even say that we can't win. <laughs> and all right then, we pray, Lord, deliver us from evil. Lord, if we are too weak in and of ourselves, then let evil die of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Amen? You know? If the good guys are too weak to win, then, you know, let evil self-destruct. And isn't that, isn't that one of the major themes of the Proverbs about how the bandit uh, digs a, a, a pit in the ground and then the, the evil man ends up falling into the pit of his own making? That's consistently a theme in the Proverbs and in the Psalms. Yes, Lord, we are so weak. Let evil die of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Uh, That's something that we should pray for. (laughs) Well, we've come to the end of the 57 words which changed the world. I hope it's been a a helpful sermon series. I've enjoyed preaching it. Um, It's the prayer that we said, to recap, encompasses all of time, past, present, and future. In regard to the past— With respect to the past, our greatest need in the past is none other than the need of forgiveness. God, forgive me of all the things that I've done wrong in my past. With regard to the the present, the greatest need we have in the present is the need of sustenance. Therefore, God, you know, give me my daily bread, food, clothing, you know, health, etc. And our greatest need when we look to the future is none other than the one we talked about today. I need protection. I need, the, I need you to protect me against all that would threaten to harm me. The world, the flesh, the devil are sworn enemies. We also said that if you look at the verb tenses in the Lord's Prayer, they're pretty much all imperatives. And the imperative mood is the mood that you use in Greek for commands. So we're not—we're saying, God, hallowed, do it. Hallowed be your name. God, forgive do it. Forgive. Um, We're saying, God, give me our daily bread. We're boldly asking God to do what only God can do on on our behalf. The, The most interesting part of the Lord's Prayer, though, in conclusion, I want you to see how God, how does God choose to answer the Lord's Prayer for us? What does he give to us as an answer to each of these six petitions? The, he gives us, drum roll, anybody? What does he give us? He gives us Christ. Christ is the answer to all six of the things that we ask for in the Lord's Prayer. You doubt me? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> Your name be hallowed. And Jesus shows up as the man who perfectly embodies the bearing of the name of God, the the embodiment of the holiness of God and the love of God, the the man who faithfully bears God's name. Your will be done. Jesus perfectly fulfills God's will, demonstrating what a commitment both to holy obedience and generous sacrificial compassion and mercy looks like in a single human being. Your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus says, I am the bread of life, and he gives us himself. The the only one who can satisfy the ravenous hunger of a human soul. Cancel our debts. I'll take them to the cross. I'll nail them to the cross. And in so doing, pay the debt that you owe myself. And then I will tell you, as we talked about last week in the sermon, to go and do likewise and freely cancel the debts that others have against you. And then finally, Deliver us from the evil one. Um, maybe my favorite sermon that I've ever preached, I don't know if it was my best, but it was another, well, it was in the last year when I was preaching on Colossians, on the passage that speaks about how Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities, how he triumphed over the devil and the demons there on the cross, how he completely vanquished the enemy on the cross. Um, and there you have it. He, it's Christ in every single one of these. 
You might even say it's just as the Apostle Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians verse 1, chapter 1, verse 20. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes and amen in Christ. And it turns out that he is also the yes to all of our prayers. The answer to the Lord's prayer is the Lord himself. What an indescribably great gift. Amen.